um, Utah State University Extension. I work in integrated pest management throughout the state. And I'll be talking about some major pests of fruit. And I wanna kind of get you guys uh, <clears throat> thinking while I'm talking, um, since I'm talking about fruits, does anyone wanna put in chat what this fruit is in this picture? And then I'm gonna have some other pictures as well throughout where I'll ask you to tell me what you think it is. So this will also tell me if you guys are actually uh, listening. <laughs> yes, thank you. Nectarine, so I have an easy one here. Nectarine, yes. Apricot, I'm sorry, apricot is correct, Vera. Okay, anyway, the major pests I'm gonna cover, I'm breaking it out into apple, pear, peach, and cherry. And um, JD talked about a couple of these, so I'm just gonna, um, I, while he was talking, I went and did some editing on my presentation to make that those shorter, the fire blight, perennium blight. Um, but let me go ahead and start with apple and pear. And here's another picture of a fruit crop. Um, if you guys wanted to go back to your chat, what do you think this is? So have a look at that. So for apple and pear, I'm gonna talk about aphids and uh, I'm gonna include woolly apple aphid with that discussion because that's one that uh, I'm getting more and more calls on lately. And so I decided to include that and coddling moth. Um, and then just maybe a couple of words on fire blight. So someone um, I see put in goji berry. So they, yes, that is what this is. All right, so aphids. Um, and again, I, I'm keeping this kind of basic um, for you guys to get ready for customers in your store and making pesticide recommendations. Um, but aphids is always a question that comes up, especially on those cool, uh, wet springs that we have sometimes because you get that nice succulent growth. So with apples, there's two species, rosy apple aphid and green apple aphid, and they overwinter as eggs on the trees. They feed with these piercing, sucking mouth parts so that creates a lot of honeydew, which is wet and sticky. And while I'm on aphids, I just wanna mention there's a specific species to peaches, so green peach aphid, and to cherries, black cherry aphid. And just a note that I wanted to make you aware of um, is that one of the aphids, the rosy apple aphid, can actually result in this distortion of the fruit when the aphids are feeding in the flower cluster area. It's just these toxins from their saliva that results in that distorted fruit. So I know that, you know, people who work in garden centers often get customers that bring in these different uh, samples and want them identified. We can always help identify them, but it's good for you guys to have a sense of what's going on too. Okay, so I mentioned that woolly apple aphid is becoming more prevalent in backyard trees, which it hadn't been before. Um, so it's a little bit different in terms of its management and its life cycle, but it can reduce tree vigor. And if it's very heavy on young trees that it could actually kill them. Um, this is, I like this picture because it shows all the different places where these aphids are found and where they're feeding. So they can be in these uh, old pruning cuts at the juncture of a, a branch, a twig, at the base of a stem, um, old wounds. So those are the types of areas that they like to feed. And they're different from those other aphids in that they overwinter Number one, as an adult. And number two, they're mostly found on the roots you know, rather than up in the tree. Some of them will be in the tree, but most of them are on the roots. Uh, and we also don't see them in the tree really until mid spring. Whereas the aphids feeding on the foliage, we see them soon after the leaves emerge. Uh, so, when people ask about the woolly apple aphid, it's after it looks like this. And the tree is just kind of dripping with this cottony substance. Um, in all the way up to October, we've gotten calls from people. But really, like I said, 
if you're looking at the tree, people can go and see it. The colonies start to form around mid-May, mid to late May. But once it gets at that point, it's very difficult to manage. So as the aphids feed uh, on the twigs, it can cause these swellings to form. So that's one another diagnostic feature of the woolly apple aphid. Those swellings may split. Um, but I mentioned they feed on the roots as well. And their feeding on the roots also causes uh, those swellings. And that is what really contributes to the decline in vigor of these trees. I'm just gonna do something real quick. Okay, so as far as managing these different aphid species, so uh, the regular species that feed on foliage are managed differently than the woolly apple aphid. And so we recommend the timing uh, to deal with those that overwinter is eggs, as I mentioned, is to go ahead and do a good application on the tree when it's dormant. And I say dormant, but what I really mean is this term called delayed dormant. And what that means is the timing between the buds starting to swell. And when they're about uh, any one of these stages shown in these pictures. So this is actually a pear, uh, cherry and peach. So basically before bloom. And I don't have a picture of an apple there, but we call the, the end timing for apple half inch green. So that oil can be applied during any of that time period um, because that's when those eggs are starting to become a little bit active and they're more susceptible to treatment. And so the problem we run into is that people are wanting to put their oil on like now, and it's just too early. It's too early for that dormant oil application. So on the flip side, the woolly apple aphid management um, and also targeting the regular aphids after they're on the foliage. There's a couple of options here. And I'm just showing you some uh, active ingredient names because I know that each one of your businesses sells different products. So I didn't want to put a product name. Um, so I'm just giving you some ingredient names. The uh, insecticidal soap or oil are organic and would only be effective with a real good strong application that's gonna target those colonies. Um, mixing the two together is more effective because the oil is gonna be able to penetrate into the colony a little bit better. So if you're recommending an insecticide, you might say, oh, why don't you add in um, some horticultural oil with the insecticide? I would say on this last point here, I have said the word pyrethroid. So um, if you're not familiar with that, that's any ingredient that has this, um, usually the last few letters end in thrin, and they're all related to each other. Okay, codling moth. Um, this is the primary pest of apple and pear. And typically the management might begin on average about three weeks after bloom. And this is the larva, and their goal is to tunnel into that fruit and find the seeds. So they want to feed on the seeds and then exit. And as they're feeding, they're pushing out their poo or their frass, and that's pretty easily seen on the outside of the fruits. So this insect is around all season long, and so I just want to show a quick life cycle. So they spend the winter as a larva in protected areas. And they're not in the tree for the most part. So this is another one where people may ask, well, I wanna buy some oil to spray on my tree for codling moth for the dormant timing. And no, it does not take care of codling moth at that timing uh, because they're in other protected uh, areas. And in spring, they emerge as an adult moth and then they lay eggs either on the fruit or on the foliage. And if you're recommending anyone to treat codling moth, it's to target the eggs that are laid on the foliage. Um, so the eggs hatch and then right away, they go into the fruit. They finish their life cycle in the fruit, become mature uh, caterpillars, emerge. And this whole life cycle uh, repeats itself for about 
two to three times during the growing season. So that's why this is a pest that has to be managed almost all season long. Um, so I have two tables of product recommendations that uh, you guys could know about for um, kami moth, conventional and organic. And a couple of things I wanted to point out. So again, here you see a lot of these pyrethroids. Um, there's like JD was saying, fewer and fewer pesticide options that are really good for the homeowner side, which is not, um, I don't know why they don't, you know, there's a lot of really great products on the commercial side, even that are very reduced risk. They're not being made available on the backyard side um, because that's not the commercial manufacturer's goals. But anyway, so some of these options uh, last up to 17 days and like malathion only lasts maybe five days in terms of that residual period. Um, some things that would be important to note for talking to your customers is that some of them, for example, this product, you have to wait 21 days before eating the fruit. This product can only be used on pears. And some, mal some products that have malathion, I'm not sure why, say pears only, um, and, but most of them say just a maximum of two sprays. So again, we're becoming more limited in what we can use. Um, and then some organic products are shown here. Um, and we'll have this recording for you that you guys can refer back to. So I don't have time to talk about each one. All right, so JD already mentioned fire blight. I just wanted to point out, he's talked about a, um, a symptom called shepherd's crook. So that's what it looks like there. The bacteria started in the flowers and spread out to the shoot. Um, and then it can also get into the main trunk. And this is the bacteria oozing from the stem. Um, if someone comes to your store and says, I know I have fire blight, it's the middle of the summer and they wanna buy some antibiotic to spray, say, no, 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 no. Um, it should, the antibiotic should only be used during bloom. Um, so after infection has happened, their only options are pruning out the uh, fire blight. And as far as pruning, JD already mentioned that um, the pruning should be done about 12 to 14 inches beyond that symptomatic uh, tissue. Okay, so here I have another picture for you guys to try and guess what kind of fruit this is shown on the right. Um, just so you know, that it could be a tree, or it could be a shrub. And you guys are wrong. Wrong. <laughs> not blueberry, not aronia, not currant. Mm. So it's service berry. And um, if you haven't grown service berry, I highly recommend it. Although JD might not because they do get iron chlorosis a little bit, uh, but the berries, I just love them. Um, anyway, so with peach, I wanted to cover gamosis and greater peach tree borer. So the reason I wanted to co cover gamosis, um, it's not really a, a disease or a pest per se, but it is the most common question that I get. And I would assume that a lot of people would come into your stores and ask about it, saying my peach tree is oozing gumming. Um, and they always think it's boars. So anyway, the comments I wanted to make is that, um, and JD mentioned this as well, uh, a lot of our stone fruits can ooze gumming for a variety of different reasons, not caused by a pest. And so I've shown some reasons here. Um, in this picture, it, the gumming that you see is kind of clear in color. So that tells me, well, it's not that big a deal. And I scraped the bark or the epidermis away from this gumming area. And you can see underneath it's nice and green and healthy. And so that's absolutely nothing to worry about. Um, I think one of the common causes of something like this is um, when the tree is over, has produced a ton of fruit the prior year. Um, it's just caused a bit, a bit of a stress on the tree. 
Um, but here's a picture of what gamosis might look like from borers, where it's dispersed in the tree. The gumming is kind of oozing out in a tendril-like fashion. Um, and of course, there's going to be uh, holes associated with gamosis and borers. And so the question was, what, well, what would it look like if you scraped the bark away and it was borers under there? You would probably see, and I don't have a picture of that, unfortunately, but you would see some, scraped a lot of bark away, some galleries. You actually might find a, a white little larva in there. Um, so you might have to scrape a little bit more bark away, but you should see some evidence in terms of feeding gallery or some sawdust-like frass packed into that area. Um, but the oozing might be a very dark color. And in this case, this actually is caused by a pathogen, a disease um, called Cytospora canker. So when I scrape the bark away from here, you can see the tissue underneath is starting to become brown and dead. And that's the fungus killing the outer bark and the phloem um, as it moves through the tree. So that could be another cause of the gamosis, um, but if someone showed me this picture, usually a homeowner, they'll automatically say, I have borers, I've been spraying it, it's not helping. Um, so it does kind of take a while to, to uh, back and forth to figure out what the problem is. Here's just another example. Um, the gumming on the left there is not quite that dark in color, but still remove the outer bark and you can see the tissue dead underneath. So again, that's the Cytospora canker. Um, it's what we call an opportunistic pathogen. So it needs a wound to enter into the tree to cause infection. So that wound could be like a pruning cut, um, winter injury, sun scald, which is common here in Utah, um, or even like cat scratches or some animal scratches on the bark. So just quickly, um, management of Cytospora. Unfortunately, you're not gonna be able to sell uh, anything. Maybe you can sell some pruners um, because you wanna make sure to tell people that they need to prune their trees properly. That's a great way to prevent Cytospora. So proper pruning practices. Um, a nice warm day in spring, or I'm sorry, in winter, people wanna get out and prune their fruit trees and apples, that's fine. But peach trees in the dead of winter um, or apricot, nect nectarine should not be pruned. So ideally wait, have people wait until um, into spring if they can. This is a picture of a commercial grower that's actually pruning in uh, right before bloom, which is uh, maybe a little late, but still that's, that's fine. Um, the reason is pruning in the winter can bring the tree out of dormancy a little bit, cause some wounding, result in uh, increased chance for infection. So if the buds are like this, that's a great time that you can tell people to prune their peaches. And the other thing that we see in terms of pruning is that where there are stub cuts, that's where a lot of this infection happens. And so telling people to get, uh, create nice clean cuts is important. Um, a couple other things with prevention, I mentioned sun scald can be a way where Cytospora may enter into the tree. And so um, white tree wrap, which is another thing you could sell, keep in stock, or a mix of uh, white latex paint and water, a 50-50 mix, one-to-one -one mix. And then finally, some re research has shown that trees that are deficient in certain micronutrients iron included, um, will be more susceptible to this disease. And finally, pruning out in, uh, infected branches. Okay, so the other disease or issue with peach trees that we hear a lot about is greater peach tree bore. But this one is an easy one to manage. Um, so it's a moth. And this picture in the lower part is the adult. Looks like a wasp, but it's actually a moth. And she lays, the female lays her eggs right at the base of the tree. And larvae,
feed in the roots in the base of the tree and cause uh, copious amounts of gumming. And you can see this type of damage could certainly kill a younger tree. So this on the picture on the left just shows a mature larva. And uh, in springtime is where you'll hear from a lot of people about oh, I'm seeing this lot of oozing at the base of the tree um, because that's when the larvae are starting to become active again. They overwinter inside the tree, start feeding again in spring, and then they don't emerge from the tree until around mid-June. Um, but I've seen a lot of pictures like this where you got weeds or grass growing right up to the base of the tree. And A, that's where the moths like to go down and lay their eggs. They're nice and protected um, and can, can lay their eggs easily in there. But B, because of the turf and the weeds, People, the owners aren't noticing that ooze until several years down the road. So the, I mentioned is easy to manage and um, I would just recommend an insecticide. And it's really just spraying the base of the tree up a few inches from the soil line, maybe eight inches or so, once a month from mid-June to mid-September. And products that contain permethrin um, that have peach or nectarine on the label is what you would want to recommend. Uh, let's see, for perennial blight, JD mentioned this. The only things I wanted to point out are, he said that you can put copper down in fall and infections will happen on the new fresh leaf scars. So the reason for the copper application is to cover these leaf scars and prevent that infection right there. Um, and then I wanted to point out, let's see, the shuck split application. An option that you could recommend is fungicide called chlorothalonil. And then this disease can continue to cause infections throughout the summer on rainy periods. Um, chlorothalonil cannot be used after this shuck split timing. So uh, miclobutanil or Captan would be other options to recommend during the summer. All right, so the last pest I want to mention, and here you have another fruit crop. If you guys are uh, still there, you can type in chat what you think this one might be. Yes, elderberry. It's becoming popular to grow it for jam, jellies, juices, wine, yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm going to finish up with Western cherry fruit fly. So that is the major pest of um, cherries. And so the fruit flies, they overwinter in the soil. And then the adult flies emerge around May. And the females, they lay their eggs underneath the skin of the fruit. And of course, the maggot, as you see here, feeds inside the fruit. And this is the picture of what an adult fly looks like. Uh, so because she lays her eggs under or inside the fruit, any kind of spray treatment for cherry fruit fly is targeting the adults. And um, so if I go back up and talk about the greater peach tree borer that lays the eggs on the bark. So there you're targeting the eggs. So it's another you know, way to think about how pests are managed. So you're targeting the adults for cherry fruit fly. And when the fruits are this color shown on the left, green, still a little bit hard, um, the cherry fruit fly cannot penetrate the skin to lay the eggs. So when the, everything's still green, people should not be spraying their trees. And then when the fruits get this, what we call a salmon blush color, that's when the adults can penetrate through the skin of the fruit and lay her eggs. So what we recommend is whenever people see this color change in the sunniest part of the tree, that's when you should start. So the rest of the fruit could be look like this, be green, um, but this is just kind of a timing to start when the earliest fruit on the tree start turning. And as far as what to use, um, there's a couple of options. Um, in this recording, you could go back to the 
codling moth list. And a lot of those would, could be recommended for cherry fruit fly. So I mentioned pyrethroids, those ingredients that end with thrin, malathion, and then organic uh, spinosad. So the fruit fly is laying eggs all actually all the way up to October. And so the management would begin at the first blush timing up until harvest or, or whenever that product you're applying uh, up to that pre-harvest timing. Um, just for some non-chemical options that if people are asking about, uh, the maggots from the fruits, they drop to the ground into the soil. And so if there's any way to prevent those maggots from getting into the soil, that's one option. And so that could be like a tarp under the tree. The fruits may, or the maggots may still be in the dropped fruit that drop, fall to the ground. So removing those and removing any unharvested fruit or even uh, a tree that's not being harvested at all. You know, um, we wanna encourage people to manage their fruit crops, but if they're not managing them, maybe encourage them to plant something else. Um, and might be something you could consider selling is uh, netting, insect netting and cover the entire tree. Okay, so quickly, just one more minute to finish up. Um, JD has mentioned our website, utahpests.usu.edu. And you can also get to it from this link, ipm.usu. And I haven't talked about the service we offer. It's uh, some pest advisories that we email out, Nick and I, on fruit and vegetable pests to tell you uh, what pests are active, what products would be used to control them. So you could subscribe to that through this link and I'll, I'll put that in the chat too. So um, I'm gonna finish up there. I'll skip to this last slide. So one more fruit crop. You guys wanna try and guess what that is. Um, and Mike, JD, and everyone, you can contact all, any of us anytime. You know, again, that's what we're here for. So there's my email and my phone number. Um, and, uh, you know, you can let, let us know if you have any questions. So does anyone have any idea what this is? <laughs> yeah, so it, I, I mean, I only learned about this somewhat recently, but yeah, it's um, sea berry or sea buckthorn. I guess it's super, super high in vitamin C and people are experimenting with it, um, but very, very tart. So 